A while ago, I did a video on building a character rig, and it seems appropriate to get that rig moving. Bugs Bunny animator Ken Harris said, A walk is about the hardest thing to get right. So beginning with the walk seems like the right way to go. Now as I was completing my preparations for this tutorial, I started to have a funny feeling that I should do another tutorial that teaches the walk in the traditional manner, because this tutorial definitely does not do that. I do plan to teach a walk in the traditional manner in the future, for a couple of reasons. One, I can contribute to the community, which is already helping to bring clarity of thought to how a walk is done. Two, the last time I did something in a different way, in my Animating to Extremes tutorial, two people didn't like that enough to take the energy to dislike my video on YouTube, and nobody's liked it so far. I hope that doesn't happen again, but instead that people see the value in a new approach and like this tutorial, but I think it might happen again, because this definitely diverges from the traditional walk instruction. I must say in my own defense that I'm giving proper homage to the traditional walk instruction, using it not to disregard completely in favor of my own, but as a springboard for thinking to lead me in how to do my walk. And this is honestly the way I approach the walk on the computer. It's thinking like an artist and like a computer at the same time. I do it this way because there are some advantages. One, this way it's easier for me to see the weight and the thrust of the muscles going on in the body. The walk's strength is primarily in the legs. And that's where I start. Two, even though my method takes a large amount of abstract thinking, it ends up building a very solid foundation. Three, knee pops are not really a big issue in how I approach the walk. I'll talk more about knee pops in a moment. Now just to give our proper grounding, the traditional instruction for the walk is outlined quite well in Richard Williams' text. It is based on four poses. The contact, when both feet are first on the ground together. The down, when the weight comes down on the leg. The passing, when the passing foot is getting in front of the body, and the up, when that same passing foot is about to land for another contact. I use a method that takes full awareness of all four poses, but that thinks in extremes, not in traditional poses. The file you can use with me is in the links below. It's very much like the file I used to rig the character, with three important differences. One, Lennon is now facing the direction of her walk. Two, the hips are not facing outward, but instead behind her, essentially becoming the butt cheeks. Seeing those butt cheeks is really important because it helps us to see where the weight is. Three, and most importantly, she has toes. I debated a long time about whether to include toes, but in the end I decided to. This is because the foot looks a lot more correct when it's coming off the ground if the toes trail. Now I want to start with the hip. Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston describe most actions as starting from the hips, which was one of the big discoveries in the early Disney days. I'm treading softly, but I'm going to diverge right away from the standard practice of starting with the contact pose. Instead, I'm starting with the up pose, because the up and down are the extremes of the hip, not the contact or the passing position. I think I might have a little support in starting this way, which I would like to think is support in Art Babbitt. Art Babbitt created Goofy and did all kinds of wonderful animation for Disney. He was all about inventing, and interestingly enough, he started his walks not on the contact poses, but on the down poses. I thought that was interesting, and it got me to thinking about other ways to approach the problem of how to do a walk. I wanted to start with the up pose, firstly because it's an extreme, and secondly because it seems to be the most precarious of the four walking positions. That is, if walking is a series of controlled falls, then that foot had better get back to contact fast or the body's going to fall. The up position is the position that most implies to me that motion must happen. But before I go to the up and down, I do want to see this hip travel across the stage. So I'll separate dimensions and start with the x-axis. I'm going to guess, based on Lennon's height and legs, that she can make it across the stage in 7 or 8 steps. I'm running 30 frames per second here, a bit of an odd number. If I follow the standard 2 steps per second timing, I'm going to have trouble dividing. I'll have each step at 15 frames and dividing 15 by 4 poses is too much. So I'm going to have my walk a bit slower, 2 steps every 32 frames, a little bit slower than a second per walk cycle. If 2 steps happen every 32 frames, and I'm right that she can go across in 8 steps, that means that she'll get all the way across the stage in, let's see, 32 times 4, so about 130 frames. Earlier when I was doing this, I tried at 200 frames, which ended up being too slow. But let's start there anyway. There's no slowing down or speeding up as she walks across, just a constant rate across the stage. So making her rate faster or slower is going to be easy. Now I concentrate on the y-axis, the up and down movement. With the Y, I want to start Lennon in an up position, so I raise the hip slightly upward. Incidentally, I've turned off all but the hip and the feet. This helps me focus on what I want to see, which is how the legs are operating. If I start with an up pose, my next extreme will be the down pose. 
Since I'm running two steps every 32 frames, and each step has four poses, that means I've got to accomplish eight poses every 32 frames. So each pose will be four frames. From up, I go four frames to contact, and then another four frames to down. Then I set a keyframe on that down. Then I'm set. Every eight frames, a new extreme. Copy, paste, go eight frames, repeat, until she's all the way across the stage. It doesn't matter if she keeps going up and down even outside the stage. No one's going to see that. But I don't want her just going up and down in linear time, no weight given to the various poses. So I'll create eases to pad the way between the ups and the downs, or just press F9 in After Effects. Now I want to consider gravity, and that gravity is going to make her come down faster and stay down longer. So I stretch these tangents out at each of the down positions. This makes her have to work harder to get back up, and she's going to drop down a bit more easily. Let's take a look. Yes, the basic kind of movement I want. And I'll stop and save this composition as hip, knowing that I can change this as I go. As I do each step, I'll save the composition there, so that you can modify my animation or start at any point you want. We're spending so much time on that root, the hip, because the more accurately we get the root working, the better the rest of our work is. Now I want to consider the feet. Now there are two big determiners in how a walk feels. One we've just dealt with, the up and down movement. A happy walk has more distance and more pronouncement between up and down. The other factor is the stride and speed of the walk, which are linked together. Obviously, if a character is walking quickly, he has to spread his legs more to keep up. I learned about walks from my first mentor at Animation Mentor, a Pixar employee who had worked on Up. He mentioned how much walking there is in the movie Up and how much he learned from it. In fact, I had an extended debate with another student at that time when I was first thinking about a method for doing the walk in this manner. And now I've got that fully developed. Here we're going with the standard walk, and in a standard walk, the distance between each step is not that great. You might see the length of one person's foot between each step, sometimes a bit more or a bit less, but a standard walk will be about that distance. We'll use that knowledge as our guide. We're also going to only move the feet on the x-axis, and we're going to use blocked interpolation between keys, which means that the foot will not move at all until the next keyframe. This will help us to see whether the foot is catching the weight of the body. So I'm going to make a copy of this for the feet. Now the foot extremes are going to be down when the foot is behind the body and on the contact when the foot is in front of the body. So that means that in a 16 frame step, the foot is up for 12 of those frames. So what I'm going to do for the foot Separate dimensions. I'm going to go to that part of the animation that is contact. And I'm going to set that foot where I want it. Which is about a foot's distance in front of the other foot. Then the next time that foot's going to move, is the down. I'm going to leave that for now because I don't know where it's going to move to until I deal with the other foot. So in between this contact, there's going to be another contact. So on this down, this foot's going to start moving. And it's going to move until we're at contact. Now the question I'm asking myself is, by these feet being separated by about a foot's distance, are they supporting the weight of the hip? Clearly here the answer is no. If they are, if the hip is right about above them, about halfway above them, then the hip's going at the right pace. We already knew that the hip wasn't going to be going at the right pace. We're going to be using blocked poses. Blocked changes. This is just going to help us to see if the foot's moving as to capture the weight of the hip at the right time. So now it gives us an idea of where to move the other foot again. So it starts moving on the down and it goes to the contact, which is 12 frames later. I'm not even looking at the hip so much right now, I'm just trying to see if the feet are properly separated from one another. It doesn't have to be perfect, but you just want to get it close.
So that just messed up because I moved both keyframes already. I'm going to move this to the contact. And we're setting these as blocked keyframes just because that movement is a little bit confusing. And again, this foot starting on the down to move. I'm going to the next contact 12 frames later. Just like that. Then it won't move again till that following down. Not the very next down, but the down. There. Then this foot moving on it on the down following that other foot's contact is right there. Twelve frames to next contact. Getting close to the edge, and then this foot on that very next down. And that's the last time I'll have to move that one, I believe. Then this one, again, starting on the down, right after that contact. And going 12 frames later. And just to get it spaced about right. And that's about right. Now we're really not looking at the hip right now. We're going to deal with that in a sec, but let's just kind of see if this looks like a walk. Just the feet. Are they moving at even times? Yeah, it's probably walking, but we've got to deal with the timing of that hip because clearly it's way behind the feet. We knew that would be the case because we gave it way too many frames. So we're at 200 frames. We're going to move it back to around 130 based on our calculation just to see if we're about right. Let's just see. It's actually starting behind. I don't like where it's starting. Then let's just see if every time the foot contacts, is it there to support the hip? Still getting a little bit ahead. There's contact. In that case, I feel like we're definitely ahead of where even the foot should be. Let me pull that back a little bit. But the hip is falling behind. We just want to make sure it's catching up with where the feet are hitting. Starts falling behind again.
This foot again may be getting a little bit too far ahead. Got off the stage a little bit too fast, I think. So that one's going to want to come back and move again. Again on the next down. 12 frames later. Catching up to the other foot. Which I now believe the other foot is also a little bit ahead of where it should be. So we're fairly close. Now I'll duplicate this for the thighs. The way I'm thinking about thighs, it's when the angle of them compared to the hip is the most extreme. I did a lot of study on this, first drawing the angle in my Richard Williams text, and then doing walks myself and watching for where those extremes are. After all that, I'm going to place the extremes of the thighs on the down when the foot is in front, and the other extreme on the immediately following contact. It's going to take a while for that foot to get back in front of the body again, so that means that the leg is going back or resting back more than it is in the front. Really what it means is that as soon as the body's weight is down on that leg, the leg wants to push the body back up again. This again is part of the way I see weight and thrust in the walk. I see where the strength is. It's pushing from the thighs that are in front of the body. Now the thighs extremes are going to be down when the foot's in front and contact when the foot is behind. So there's the down. And we're going to set a keyframe, then going over to the contact. All the way through. Back to contact. And the same for the other thigh, starting with contact. For the other thigh, we'll start on contact. Set a keyframe. Followed by down when the foot's in front. All the way through contact, followed by down when the foot's in front, as in the weight going down on the foot, then contact, followed by down when the foot's in front. Followed by contact.
play it through. And it's a little bit hard to tell. But the question is, are the feet supporting the weight of the hip each time? And we can see that it's pretty close. Before going on, I want to talk about knee pops. And they are a big deal in computer animation. You can read a lot about what causes them and how to correct them. A knee pop is when the knee hits a jerky movement, sort of back and forth, kind of like you can't decide where to go. Sometimes they look very bad and sometimes they are passable, but once you start seeing them, you'll see them everywhere, even sometimes in professional level animation. One of the reasons this happens is that the leg goes from bent to straight back to bent really quickly, and the knee is going back and forth on the screen. Whereas when the body's working perfectly together, and that's quite a feat, no pun intended, but when the body's working perfectly together, the knees keep going forward at a relatively constant rate. And certainly, it doesn't go backward. But by following the traditional contact down, passing in up, it's one of the dangers. The up position will have a bent leg, the thigh of which is at a greater angle to the hip than the contact. Then the contact has a straight leg, the thigh being a smaller angle to the hip. And then we go to a down pose where the thigh's angle is greater. This will almost assuredly produce a knee pop. I should note that some animators do a walk with the knees always bent, sort of with the hip lower than it would really be, to help solve this knee pop problem. Other times we can stretch or contract the leg just a bit, and that can be a help as well. But I'm trying here to get the right extremes, and if I've got it right, the knee will be doing exactly what I want to avoid those pops anyway. Now if I run this with the calves on, going to look a little funny. You see the calves kind of stretching to where the feet go. That's because the feet are actually controlling the calves in the way I've got this model rigged. So to control the calves, we're going to control the feet. And the first thing we want to do with these feet is we want to free up that X translation. So we're going to let, let these as tangents. But that doesn't look right because the feet are just sliding across the floor. So I've got to get them up off the floor. And when I begin translating in Y, a funny and sort of unexpected thing happens. But track the heels of your feet on a video and you'll see it's true. The heel actually comes slowly up, then it starts moving more quickly, then it begins to come down, and finally it lifts again a little before slowing and landing. So I'm going to set my Y translations to do just that. The heel begins picking up, slow, it accelerates across, and it goes up and down again. Now if you think about it, there is a kind of logic to how that works. The foot starts coming up, but slowly. It doesn't want to move. But because of the way it comes up, peeling off the floor, the heel has to go rather high. But then because of the shape of the leg and because the heel wants to get back to resting, the foot is going to rotate back toward resting. But then it overshoots and this causes the second dip in return. We even get some overlap, the ball of the foot trailing the heel and the toe trailing the ball. Each part wanting to stay behind, then finally giving in to the need of the body's weight and the will of the thigh. So I get that rotation working for the foot as well, and then I get that beautiful and strange movement. So we've got to get them lifting. And we're going to get them lifting as we've just studied in the Y movement. So every time that foot moves, the Y is also going to move. Lifting up. Coming across to a low point. And 
and then back to the ground with just a little lift before that end. Rotate works along with that, also moving it about the same time. And then finally landing two frames later. Sometimes I do it as one, but that can be a little bit harsh. Now from that to that, to avoid penetration, we get to the upper position a little bit faster. Got it trailing behind, but then I don't want to penetrate through the floor, even though I am a little bit, but I'm not that worried about it right now. We get that beautiful and strange movement. We're just going to copy that through every time the foot moves. Same thing. Same thing for the right. And it's really starting to look like a pretty decent walk. Now the toe, the part I wanted to ignore and leave off. The way I've rigged this model, I have to counter animate the toe. And I hate counter animating, but basically the toe is going to resist the foot's movement, rotating against it to stay planted. When it finally decides to go, it still stays behind a bit. Then it comes through, overshoots, and finally comes down a frame or two behind the rest of the foot. My only danger here is in making the toe too floppy by trailing too many frames. I do that same for every move, copy it, and then do the same for the other toe. Now if we get the calves back on at that point, you'll see that the calves are very close to settling in to what they need to be. There's a little bit of weird stretching in them, but they're pretty close. We'll adjust that in a little while. 
But before I make the calves perfect, I want to go on to make some adjustments and clean up. The first one is kind of a pain, but I find it to be worth it. You'll notice I did not rotate the hip at all. Actually, the hip is going to have some FB rotation front to back, as well as some side to side and some twisting. Were I in a 3D program, it would be important that I nail these rotations, but I can't really do them all in a 2D program too easily. So one thing I've started to do, and it's a small thing that makes a big difference, is to bring the legs themselves forward and backward, implying a twisting rotation. Now for simplicity, I've set these translate X extremes at the downs of the hip. When the hip is down and that leg is forward, hip will go forward. Set a keyframe. And when the hip is behind, the leg is behind, the hip will go behind. All the way through. Forward. And backward. Now the Y moves with that as well. Extremes in the same spots. But as the hip is moving forward, the Y is going up. As the hip is moving backwards, the Y is going down. Not an extreme amount, just enough to imply some rotation, which would be that twisting rotation and also that side to side rotation. And it's going to be the same for that other hip. Each down is an extreme for it. And in between the extremes is where the Y is really moving. Down as the hip makes its way back. And up as the hip makes its way forward. Render it. Pretty close. So with the calves, one nice thing to have would be a straight leg right at or around contact. And that will increase the feeling that weight is going down onto that leg. Very easy to do. This just deals with the thighs. And we'll just kind of get those thigh rotations to change just a little bit. So there's that straight right there. And just right as it's coming to contact, we want to get a little bit straight. So we just make a slight adjustment on this rotation. And we're just going to get that straight going into contact.
And this one, we're not really sure where it's going to go, but we just kind of guess. It's straight leg going into contact. Same thing for the other thigh, just dealing with the rotation. And of course, we have that weird bend at the beginning anyway that we want to deal with. Just to get that straight as we're going into contact. And we can do some final adjustments on the feet as well. That calf is getting quite short there. I feel like I've just lifted it up a little bit too far, which will probably be true all throughout. At this point, I'd rather have a little penetration because we can cover that as though it's on the floor other ways. Lift just a little bit higher. to take care of some of these loose ends here. Very forward walk. I'm going to pull the hip back just a smidgen. Starts off moving too fast. Made it. This process is the majority of our time in the walk because it's laying the foundation. The rest is framing it out, so to speak. It's amazing how much easier the rest of the animation becomes once we've laid this foundation. As a reminder, I've saved a composition at each step in the file I provide, so you can be free to start at any point, modify whatever you want, etc. There's a lot to think about and a lot to practice and enough of me talking and clicking. The rest of the walk will come next week. Thanks as always, and please do spread the word and subscribe.